All right. Uh, so it sounds like my mic is live. So thank you for sticking around this afternoon. Uh, again, so I'm Harlan Harris. Uh, my day job is I work for the Education Advisory Board. We build enterprise software and do best practices research for colleges and universities. And as Jared mentioned, uh, I'm also co-founder of Data Community DC and the Data Science DC Meetup. If you are in town, you should definitely uh, uh, check us out. Uh, my academic background is in machine learning and in cognitive science. I'm not a software architect by training, but I have worked closely with software architects on a number of product, uh, projects. And so I'm gonna talk today about some things that I have learned. Uh, so I'm going to talk about architecture, and I'm going to talk about choices. So first of all, what is software architecture? What do I mean? I'm just going to steal from Wikipedia. Uh, it's the high-level structure of a software system, particularly a complicated software system, as well as the uh, sort of processes and things around it. And then in terms of choices, uh, what I mean is what technologies are you going to use? What are the boundaries between each of those technologies? What do the piece, different pieces do? And also, importantly, who's responsible for building each of the pieces of these technologies? And in order to make good uh, architectural choices, you have to ask good questions. And so I'm today going to walk through some questions that I found to be helpful when making choices about software architecture, and particularly uh, when it involves uh, R. So a bunch of questions. First question, is it a data product at all? Uh, so, some of you may have read this book, Data Jiu-Jitsu, by DJ Patil, who is now a DC resident. He also has the second-rate title of Chief Data Scientist of the United States. Uh, but anyway, he wrote this great little 18-page uh, ebook about data products. However, it doesn't really define a data product uh, to my mind. And so, particularly when working in R, um, not all of our work is data products. And so, if you're do whoa, keynote quit unexpectedly. I have never seen that. All right, I'll be right back. <laughs> Should have used PowerPoint. Uh, R Markdown, okay. okay. Uh, let's see, where am I? Hey, we're back. Uh, okay, right, so if you're doing an analysis that doesn't have what an archetype architect might describe as a maintenance phase, then maybe you don't have to worry about this stuff. So if you're writing a report in SWEAVE or something or a one-off Shiny app, then you know, tune out for the next uh, 17 minutes. But if you do have a maintenance phase, then I think you need to ask these questions and make some of these choices. So next question is how many users uh, are you writing this application for? So if you have something small, maybe used just by a few or a few dozen people inside of an organization, you might make a different choice. There's some really great options uh, for this. So half the people uh, in the last two days have talked about Shiny, killer tool for hosting relatively simple reactive web apps. Uh, it does scale well, particularly if you pay our studio for their server product. Um, you can also roll your own with our Apache or some other things. I've seen less about our Apache and Rook in recent years. I don't know um, sort of why that is, but it's definitely an option. You can also roll your own servers in Python and so forth if you'd like. Next question. Uh, where does the model end and the rest of the application begin? So in some circumstances, your model might be the entire application. And again, something like Shiny might be a really great approach for uh, uh, solving that problem. But in other circumstances, your model might just be a small piece of a big system. Um, and this brings to mind sort of a recent trend in systems architecture called microservices. This is sort of an updated take on the services-oriented architecture uh, trend of about 10 years or so ago. And the idea is pretty simple. If you're building a little piece of a big system, you think about building a little standalone web service that interacts with the other pieces uh, in a sort of well-defined, well-architected way. Uh, and other, other pieces of the system then end up uh, rendering the web pages and the charts and graphs and so forth. So, you know, sorry, not ggplot, it's going to be JavaScript, but the model itself might be uh, re remain in R. But not necessarily. Maybe you don't actually need to have R in the loop, in, in particular in the prediction loop. So if you're fitting a regression model and your results is just some coefficients uh, or you're building just a really simple decision tree, maybe you don't actually need to bother. Somebody, I can't remember who, uh, said once that much of the time you can turn your model into just a few lines of SQL and be done with it. 
right? SQL, the logic is just of a simple decision tree. And so maybe all you need to do is throw your coefficients over the wall. Uh, not always a good idea, but there are exceptions. A slightly more powerful approach is PMML, predictive model markup language. This gives you a little more control over things like feature engineering. Uh, and there are some interesting options uh, there too. Next question, how often at what tempo do you need to make predictions? Uh, do you need to make predictions on a daily basis, or do you need to make predictions in the next, say, 20 milliseconds? And so architecturally, you're gonna make a really different choice uh, depending on this. So that is, is it a batch or on-demand process? Or equivalently, how far in advance do you know what entities you need to predict? Um, a note on the sort of on-demand thing. Uh, so the performance of, of different algorithms varies a lot in terms of how quickly the latency can be if you have a new example. Uh, so things like k-nearest neighbor is really expensive to make new predictions if you're happy to do that really fast. Uh, things like support vector machines can be kind of slow as well. Even random forests are doing a really simple thing but a fair number of times. If this is really important to you, there are some interesting uh, techniques that I've learned about recently, uh, such as lattice regression, that actually turn types of prediction model into like a linear interpolation of lookup tables, uh, and this can be incredibly fast. So that was prediction. There's, the next question is fitting. How frequently do you need to fit a model? Uh, so you know, if you're doing this on an annual basis, this is probably somebody sitting down, they're taking a week, they're trying to figure out what all the, the best hyperparameters are and the best architecture and everything else. That's a very different story from a daily fit. This is probably something you're doing automatically, uh, but you're gonna have monitoring processes that are gonna tell you what your daily cross-validation score is or something. And if you're doing this on an ongoing basis, so every time an input comes in, you're shifting your coefficients or something, then you're probably using some sort of specialized online algorithm. The architectural choices here uh, are, depend a lot on the frequency of fitting. Uh, this, of course, is related to the concept of concept drift or covariate drift, so how fast does the world that you care about change? Uh, if you're thinking about quarterly retail sales, that kind of world changes pretty slowly, and you're maybe fitting on an annual basis. If you're doing high-frequency finance or Twitter trends or something, then the world is changing uh, pretty quick. Next question, how many models are you building? Are you building one model? Are you building one per product line? Are you building one per user? So potentially a very large number of, of models. Uh, and so these questions are actually sort of begging the question of how much design or how much feature engineering are you uh, actually doing for the models that you're building? Uh, or equivalently, at what granularity do you need to apply domain knowledge to be effective? So recall that substantive expertise in a domain uh, is a critical part at being effective in data science. And so having an architecture that lets you apply your domain knowledge at the right times and the right level of granularity is really critical uh, to building a, a good model in production. There's also all the nitty gritty of writing software. So, uh, you know, what happens if you have a model and it breaks, so stops making predictions? You definitely need to know about that. Uh, you know, even worse, what happens if it starts only making stupid predictions and you don't find out for a month what happens to you if that's the case? <laughs> uh, so this uh, is a quote from uh, Russell Belkin in a recent talk about um, uh, building data products, stuff they've known, you should definitely read this blog post. Uh, so the quote is, there's only one right answer and starting point for a data product, understanding how you will evaluate performance and building evaluation tools. Good advice. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about kind of like one and a half examples of uh, architectures that I've been involved with. The first one here, uh, I'm gonna be really vague, so I don't actually have permission to identify the product or the domain, uh, but I can tell you a lot about the architecture. Um, and so the situation is I'd created a multi-part model in R, used a bunch of packages and techniques that would have been incredibly difficult to rewrite in another platform. Uh, the predictions of the model, it was actually this sort of quasi-Bayesian thing were forecasts for thousands of entities. But fortunately, that set of entities was known and bounded and didn't change that quickly. So we decided that the right thing to do is to annotate a database and to update those annotations frequently. So I'm gonna tell you more about that decision. Incidentally, I did extract the sort of framework uh, for this architecture uh, and put it on GitHub. Uh, so if you wanna check that out, please do. 
Uh, note, however, this is a few years old. I might make some different sort of decisions on the details if I were to redo this now. But it's a good starting point, I think. So to answer my own questions, absolutely a data product expected maintenance and upgrades over time, hundreds to thousands of users, um, but really a small component of several different uh, applications. Uh, really importantly, because of the complexity of the algorithm that was already sort of developed in R, we wanted to keep R in the loop. Um, predictions, however, not super frequent, so relatively small number of entities. Uh, the world didn't change that quickly, so if the entity was known to have changed, we'd update it sort of daily, otherwise, or sorry, hourly, otherwise we'd update it once or twice a day. Uh, fitting, also pretty slow, so once a quarter, twice a year, something like that. Um, the key is no real-time prediction, um, so using a database to mediate, and not a huge number of separate models. And so this is an architectural uh, diagram, lots of boxes and arrows, so don't worry about it. Uh, the key point is that the prediction system was on a clock, and it pulls in business data from a database, makes predictions, pushes the results back into the database, and then all the systems, the architectures on the left, or sorry, the applications on the left, um, are not actually touching R at any point in the processes of getting the UI in front of, of users. So R was in production, but it was not in the real-time uh, part of the loop. Uh, also worth noting a little bit about what I actually stored in the database. So this is uh, sort of the, the content was the uh, ID or the foreign key of the uh, entity so that it could be um, uh, joined, a uh, timestamp, which is really handy for making sure that your predictions uh, have not gotten stale, uh, and then also the results of this, this forecast process, which as I mentioned had, was a Bayesian, so it had a posterior distribution. So I stored the expected value as well as the CDF. The CDF is great because it allows you to read off prediction intervals. So you can say, you know, I, I expect the outcome to be between the 10th and 90th percentile. And that gives the users some range of, of understanding of how confident you are. Um, and as a tangent, it's actually a really good idea to be imprecise when you know that you're imprecise. And it builds trust. So if your model can do, you know, the little sort of shrug emoticon, right, then people will trust it more when it's actually confident. So to the extent that you can build that in, that's a big plus. So from math to nitty gritty, um, really quickly here, uh, configuration. This is pretty easy in R. It's an interpreted language. You just source a file that assigns some things to variables. Uh, one thing that we learned is it's handy to separate model configuration from environment configuration. So you might want to change the model configuration but the ops guys, they want to change the configuration of what database they're pointing to and some other things. And it's good to have those separate so they're not like playing with your model parameters. Um, uh, logging is also easy. There are a couple of good packages. Log for R uh, was the John Miles White package. Uh, was easy to pipe to a, a monitoring system. The standard R, error handling, try catch, and, and so forth gives you the tools to catch and log errors and also to exit with fatal errors in a way that sort of you, you get to know what happened. This is kind of cool. So when you're making this decision to uh, keep R out of the real-time loop and in particular not to build a UI around your R system, it's awfully handy still to have a web page, and in particular, a web page around the status of the system. So you can use R's built-in web service that was developed for uh, help pages uh, to do other things. So this is what sort of Roka and R Apache use. Um, and so you can connect to uh, that, that web server. That the, the code is in the, the GitHub repo, and basically you uh, just create an, uh, an HTML block, and you paste in stuff that is interesting. So accounts of how many entities you've scored, whether there have any errors or weird situations, you know, things out of bounds, what the uptime is, stuff like that. Really handy, avoids having to like dive into the logging system to get some just, you know, what is the status of the system right now? But that type of application, or that type of, of system doesn't scale well if you need to serve lots of, of predictions very quickly. Uh, testing. We identified three classes of tests, and uh, other people earlier talked about uh, test that, which is a great package. Uh, there's also various types of, you know, the standard model fitting testing that you do, both on sort of historical data, as well as maybe recent stuff to look, you know, for stuff out of the boundaries of what you'd expected. Uh, that's, you know, on the data scientist side of things. Also did a process for this project of data flow testing. So working with QA staff, where they would go into the database and like, you know, wiggle some things, and you would watch the, uh, the data flow through the process, 
the prediction, the, the score get happened right back to the database, look at the log files and so forth. Important to validate that that process all works. And then post-deployment testing or monitoring. So right, it's really important to store at least a sample of your predictions so that once you know, time catches up with your predictions, you can see how well you did and make changes as necessary. Uh, just a note, the first time we did this deployment, figuring all this stuff out was a giant pain in the ass because none of the tech people had any idea of what to do when faced with an application with no interface um, and very limited amount of, of sort of direct testing that they could do. And you know, who's to say what the right answer is also? They, they don't really like that. Anyway, but, but we got through that. Uh, so that was that application. I also want to give a shout out here to Jeremy Stanley who gave a really nice talk about a somewhat related architecture that they use at sail through at uh, MLConf last month, just up the street. Uh, unlike my use case that I just talked about, their world does change quickly, so they actually refit their models on a daily basis automatically. Uh, if you're interested in that, definitely check out the YouTube video uh, later. So in my few remaining minutes, I'm gonna uh, tell you a little bit about my current project at EAB. This is a model of student success. That is the likelihood of individual students at our uh, uh, customer organizations to graduate. And it's used by academic advisors for triage as part of a big workflow tool. So to answer my own questions again, uh, data product. Um, so importantly, one model per customer uh, with customizations. Uh, so the model is fit only rarely, and so we do want the ability to apply our domain knowledge, um, but the outcomes change slowly. So basically people only graduate once or twice a year, um, so we don't need to fit very often. But we do need to score on demand and particularly to help with hypotheticals. So what might happen if a student switched majors? Uh, we want a platform that can uh, 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 provide a score or a likelihood in that sort of hypothetical situation. And we also, as part of these decisions, wanted a platform that could support other data products in the future using the same architecture. Uh, so, you know, potentially multiply these numbers by something else to look at what we might be able to uh, do down the road. And just fairly recently fi figured out, finished out this decision process, looking at technologies and boundaries and so forth. We did this fairly complicated decision rubric, looking at a couple of different types of costs and performance and flexibility, uh, looking at operational complexity for uh, solutions that included a vendor, looking at what their support would be, what direction they move. And we looked at a half dozen or so different systems or architectures. Some were you know, more R, some involved actually switching to an entirely different uh, language. Um, and we came up with an answer, which in this case was a New York company, uh, Y Hat. Their science ops product allows very rapid deployment of models in R or Python. Uh, to a cluster with load balancing and a high performance uh, API. And for us, it really hit the sweet spot of sort of scalable sc scoring, the ease of deploying many models. Um, and in particular, it draws the who does what architectural line uh, really well and really consistent with our sort of vision. And so the architecture here, uh, the key thing uh, is that we want the data scientists to uh, own the data science stack, which means that we're responsible for modeling in R or Python and getting those models up and running as a robust service. But the actual user-facing applications are written by other people and will rely on sort of the tool uh, of science ops to bridge that gap. Uh, since there are, Joe was here earlier, folks from uh, Revolution, uh, our second choice was their Deploy R product, which does a very analogous thing of, of sort of hosting models on, on, a, on the cloud with an API. Um, there, there was the limitation of our only. We want some flexibility going forward. Uh, also, getting that, that who does what line right is tricky. And um, at least the way we were reading it, their system has a little bit more of a throw out things over the wall feel, where the expectation or the design is that developers on the application side create the API for themselves. And for us, we really wanted to draw a clean line. And you know, um, so we made that decision accordingly. Uh, so you might be asking, how's that working out for me? Um, and so the system is not yet in production, so I don't actually know. Uh, um, this said, uh, go to the Earl Conference in Boston. Uh, this is Effective Applications of the R Language. Uh, I'll be talking about my experiences uh, up there later this year. So thank you.